I like dental practices to, to make this point because I think most people, almost all business valuation experts who do this kind of work have been involved in, in a, at least a case or two in, involving a dentist. And these practices are bought and sold all the time. If the decides to hang up their spurs in the dental field, if they're smart and good businessmen, and a lot of them are, they typically position those practices for sale. Here, and, and we uh, uh, get a return on investment of $90,000 using, using a cap rate of 20% to value the practice at $450,000. And that falls in at 75% of revenue, which is a, the rule of thumb that tends to hold for these kinds of practices, and a multiple of discretionary earnings of one and a half, which also tends to fall within the, uh, the range of your typical market transaction. And, and so those who believe that it is a double counting, um, this is where I have a disagreement in a situation like this where you have a professional practitioner who has a practice that when they're done with it, they're going to sell it or they should sell it and they're likely to receive if they were to sell it today this value. <clears throat> All those earnings, okay, whether they're from the services provided by the practice owner or whether the, they're the excess earnings as it's characterized in an excess earnings methodology, it's still all earnings that are being earned by the, spo by the spouse post-dissolution. And so me, personally, would not take the position that it's a double counting because they could sell that practice right now for roughly this figure. And I don't see where a double counting has occurred. About being able to sell the practice, and I think that was the finding of the court in the, um, in the case up in Wisconsin, I think the McCreet's case. Where, where there's no double dip because the, the practice could be sold for at least what it was bought for or more X number of years later, and therefore the double dip argument was, uh, was disallowed. And I think that was McCreef out of Wisconsin. Based on the 300000 the 210000 or the $90,000 income stream. And, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Take your, take your first shot at it. Yeah, I mean, in, in my opinion, you know, I don't think that a dental practice income is – is um, a double dip situation. So I don't think we've used up the future income by virtue of recognizing it's, it's really fair market value, okay? And the 300,000 here, which is the income available to the owner, that's what would be the income for maintenance considerations when we talked about the resources and income that the uh, practitioner has available for maintenance considerations. Not the 200. So proponents of the position that it's unfair and a double use of the same income would argue that this fair market compensation here, this 210, that is the only thing that should be considered for maintenance, okay, because we've deducted it out, we've imputed it as an operating expense. Since we capitalized this number here, this 90000 to come up with our property value, you can't consider this again because that's a double counting. That's what, that's what the, the folks who have the position that it's a double dip to value a professional practice like this using an income approach and then again use the income for maintenance, okay, that's their argument. 210000 is all the income you have available for maintenance. So, so what, I can, what I would come back to you, Rob, and say is that uh, in this circumstance, with the dental practice, which is readily saleable, uh, and assuming it's general dentistry, there's not some super special work here, I, I would tend to agree with you. If, if the case were in New Hampshire, I believe the answer would be that the, the, the income to be capitalized for value would be 90 grand, and the income for support would be 210,000. Come a little right. south to Jersey, and then the income for... for um, Support would be 300 grand, as you suggested, and I think that would be the case in California, and uh, as you pointed out, mostly the east and the west coast, and a couple states in the middle. Uh, so, so that would be the. Um, uh, I think that would be the situation you would have under that example. The value. Forget the fact that a million dollar business was valued at 700 grand, and you got a long term alimony program that the trial court, after the second appeal, came back and said all right, forget about the percentage piece. We'll just give her an extra 10 grand per month. And, and uh, the Court of Appeals, 
didn't even give it back to the trial court to try it again. They just ruled from the Court of Appeals. Said no alimony, no 10 grand uh, based on the distributions. And, and, and you had some unusual circumstances there. You had distributions coming out of S Corp earnings, so, so was that a dividend or was that the sky's compensation? You got, you got that issue. Then, then the Supreme Court came along with Gallo and in some cases strengthened the argument for, uh, that a double dip exists, but also then went to the proposition that, that there, there is no bright line that's it's facts and circumstances and, 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 and what's fair. So it's, it's a great read to, to read Heller in detail in, and in all its elements, uh, Heller 1, Heller 2, Heller 3, when you look at the appeals court involvement, and then also the Gallo case, which just came out very recently, and we have quite a bit of, in our material on Gallo. But yeah, and Gallo, interesting. I think, wasn't that an ambulatory surgery center interest? The Gallo, yeah, yeah, which provided yeah. a lot of income, yeah. So, that, you know, that's a classic where, you know, I've, I've dealt with the, those ASC interests fairly routinely over the years, and, and they have a ready market amongst the docs. Sure. In fact, they usually establish the price. So, so you don't even need to use an income approach to come up with the value of those things most times, and, and they're readily saleable. Uh, in fact, you, you'd probably have docs lined up to buy yours. If, well, not uh, just docs, but hospitals and, and uh, hospital management companies. Yeah, anybody. Oh, yeah. They're, they're great. They're cheap. But they're saleable. So, 